grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome. Certainly glad to be worshiping with you uh, today. Great to see some folks drifting back in after our COVID hiatus. Welcome to one and all. We have some guests among us today. Please know how glad we are that the Lord brought you our way. It's a delight to be worshiping with you. Pray you'll feel much at home and uh, we'll be richly blessed for having passed this uh, way. Please notice the opportunities for worship and study and fellowship and service which you have printed in your bulletin. We'd love to see you again on Zoom this evening at 5 for our um, Sunday school class. We hope in reasonable time to be able to get together face to face again. I'm getting the urge for that now after a year of this separation, but not quite, not quite ready, but we're beginning to think uh, in those terms. But join us at 5 if you will. Uh, because of the COVID restrictions, we are not doing our annual uh, sunrise service again this year. It's unfortunate, but it just did not seem practical to try to figure out a way to do that for the community. Lord willing, uh, next year we can get back to it. Next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we will have a special message here. We encourage you to come. Uh, that's a wonderful occasion to invite some of your friends who may not be regularly attending church. People are more open to these kinds of invitations around Holy Days, uh, Christmas, Easter, that kind of thing. So if you come across somebody that you think might uh, benefit from being here, then give them an invitation that they could join us next Sunday for Easter worship. Next Sunday also will be the opening of a nominating period for church officers. Elders and deacons will be nominated for the class of 20. 24, 2024. Uh, there'll be much more explained about that. Uh, I'm going to be writing to you in the newsletter this week some instructions. Next week you'll have a nomination form. Lots more information to come, but you can begin to prepare for that by thinking about whom you believe the Lord is leading to service in the church as elders and deacons. Now, hear God's call to worship. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Let it never be said of us that stones had to rejoice in our place. Let us sing our praises to the Lord. Please stand. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from John's Gospel, the 12th chapter, his record of the triumphal entry. Hear the Word of God. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on His way to Jerusalem. 
They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. As it is written, do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but this, the word of our God, stands forever. Join me now in a prayer confessing our sins. Let us pray. Father, the crowds recognized your son in that moment of glory. They were all for him. They were attentive to his words and to his actions. And they professed an interest in following him. But we know how the story ended. Father, in certain ways, we too have professed our allegiance to Jesus, our enthusiasm for him. And yet, as a few days went on and the circumstances changed, we have forsaken him. And we've turned everyone to his own way. Lord, you have laid on us the iniquity that is rightfully ours, the judgment for the sins that are so numerous in our experience, on our record. We are geniuses at finding ways to sin. The diversity, the range, the variations of our sin are almost infinite. Who can save us? This one who comes in lowly majesty, this one who comes to offer himself as a sacrifice for sinners like us. And so help us to be vigilant against the sin that continues to plague us. Help us to be faithful in the face of those temptations to seek our own way. Help us to acknowledge Jesus as the one savior of sinners and help us to be faithful out of gratitude for what we've received, but also out of an earnest desire to honor this one who has come to die in our place. So Lord, see us as sinners, sinners that we are, but also for your own name's sake and for the glory of your kingdom, see us as those clothed in the righteousness of Christ. In his name we pray, amen. As Dan read the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, I remember what the the crowd was shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the songs that I've picked this morning don't directly reflect that sentiment, but it should. Because the crowd at that time were anticipating something else. Another kind of blessedness from God. And I think we as Christians need to be warned also that the blessed event that God gives us is his sacrifice. And that's what he calls us to, that example of sacrifice. So, whereas the people in Jerusalem were anticipating good things, I think we have to be careful not to focus on the good things of life, too. But the wondrous cross, the sacrifice that Jesus came to give us, to die in our place, 
to take the sins that we have on himself and to unite us to God. Please stand. When I survey
changing a little bit today. Uh, I'd like to ask the de deacons and ushers to come and uh, collect our tithes and offerings. And before we do, I'd like to pray over these. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us, for the comfort that we have in houses and cars and warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And Father, we acknowledge that all these come from you and we want to return just a small portion. And we ask in giving these tithes and offerings that they'd be used for the expansion of your kingdom that many would come to know and to praise you as Savior and King. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 95. Psalm 95, starting in verse 1. It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, for the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. If you would join with me in prayer. Father, we come to you today mindful of the description Scripture gives us of you as a holy God. Father, we honestly cannot understand that. But the truth of the matter is, we recognize that you are so far above us relative to holiness. You're perfect in every way. Father, the desire of our hearts is that we would serve you, that we would bring glory to your name through the work that we do, that we would share your love with others, that we would share not only verbally your love with others, but through our time, through what may be uncomfortable situations where we're helping people that normally we kind of pass by. Father, we ask you to forgive us for forgetting that your grace is extended to every human. Father, help us to extend that general grace through our work for you in your name as we go about our daily lives. Father, help us also to maintain an attitude of prayer. Help us to be just wildly aware of your presence as we go through the day. And keep us mindful, Father, of our responsibility to you in seeking your direction, in seeking your help, in seeking your strength. Father, the desire of our heart is that we would be used up by bringing glory to your name through the opportunities you sent our way to minister. We love you, Father. We submit ourselves to you in obedience, and we look forward to the works that you have in store, not only for us individually, for our church, and for the missionaries we support around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Guests, for our guests worshiping with us today, uh, that was not Mark Clark, that was Sam Mount. We just do that to keep it as confusing as possible. 
And speaking of confusion, I'm afraid I'm uh, contributing a little bit today in the way that I've uh, selected a couple of different passages to be reading from as our preaching texts. Um, but I hope you'll bear with me and see the, the value of this. I'm going to use a section from Luke and a section from John, beginning with the Luke passage, and try to interweave them a little bit. So I'll be going back and forth a little bit. Uh, this is called the harmonization of the Gospels, uh, not to be uh, unnecessarily complicated in any way, but I, I, I need to cover two of the last words of Christ today, and so I had to go to two different passages uh, to make that happen. I chose this series, The Seven Last Words of Christ, for this Lenten season, and there are seven words, but in Lent there are only six Sundays. <laughs> And so you see my uh, dilemma. I had to make a little contraction here. And as I, I go to this, I, I think uh, again of my dear friend, uh, my mentor, my professor, uh, Dr. Gordon Reed, whose work I have heavily relied on in this whole series. And he's on my mind and heart today, especially, and maybe you don't know him, but I know him. And um, if unless I miss my guess, because of the great impact he's had in my life, you see a little bit of him in me. Some good things I hope that you can see that he's transferred to me. Um, but he is on his uh, sickbed and is under hospice care, uh, cannot sit up, finds it difficult to speak. He's apparently in his last days of life here in this world. And he's somewhat miserable. Um, not because he dreads going home, but because life here has lost its savor and has very little to offer him, and he's confined. Uh, he, we celebrated his 90th birthday last October, and he was preaching regularly as the pastor at a church in South Carolina up till that time. Um, and for him not to be active and not being, be, being able to die in the pulpit with his boots on, as it were, is a grief uh, to him. So with strong appreciation for him um, and appreciation for his contribution to the message you're going to hear today. Hear now from uh, Luke chapter 23. I'll begin in the 44th verse and then we'll be moving quickly to John. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And now to John chapter 19, verse 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now I return to Luke's account. This is the second half of the 45th verse of chapter 23. And the curtain of the temple's, temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw, that, saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. And now we return to John chapter 19, verse 31. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. 
Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another Scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. This is the Word of God, which is flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay and purified seven times. I'd be very glad if you'd pray briefly with me once again. Father, now as we come to a concentrated consideration of your Word, we pray as always that your Spirit would be in attendance to bring this living Word to life in our own minds and hearts. Father, your word is truth, and that is what we need. And so we pray that as this word is spoken to us, we would have ears to hear and minds to believe and wills to submit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you see this scene, these scenes, which if they were to be depicted on our evening newscast would carry the disclaimer, uh, some of this may be hard to watch. Jesus' life ebbs away. His strength is lessening. These long hours of agony on the cross seem to drag by. What has it been now from 9 a.m. roughly up till noon in the darkness and then around to about 3 o'clock now, these six hours of excruciating pain following all that had been inflicted on him otherwise and the beatings uh, and the abuses, emotional and physical, that he had suffered. And we see him now at the brink of death. But before the end, there were two more words that he was to speak. It is finished, and Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We focus on the first in the beginning, it is finished. What is this about? This statement is so much more than merely an awareness that the end of life was at hand. Our verse from 28 Our passage from verse 28 reads this way, Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And then his next words are those we're considering now, it is finished. And if, if we are to understand what he meant by that, we have to interpret this word finished by those two previous words, completed and fulfilled. All was now completed so that the Scriptures could be fulfilled, And then he says, it is finished. When he said, it is finished, I think he has in mind, in a broad view, all of his life, all of the purposes of his life, from the incarnation, from his enfleshment, from his coming into the world, to this point now of his leaving the world. All that he had experienced in this sin-cursed world. It would be a terrible mistake to think that these words, it is finished, were a sigh of defeat or some sort of mere surrender to death. It was not as though Jesus were saying, I've been here, I've tried my best, but now it's over. That's not it. Instead, what we have here is a proclamation of the completion, the accomplishment of this assignment that Jesus, the Son of God, had received from God the Father. And it goes beyond any simple understanding that we might assign to it. So contrary to the appearance of the thing, and it was a sad, sorry appearance, and contrary to the gloating of his enemies down on the ground before him, hurling up these insults, contrary even to the despair, the brokenheartedness of his disciples, who must have been just distraught to see their hopes and expectations apparently dashed in such a dreadful way. In spite of all that, contrary to all of that, Jesus here is fulfilling and accomplishing all that the Father gave him to do. He had defeated death. He had defeated the devil. He had overcome the grave. He had defeated hell. That was the reality, but only the triune God. Only Father, Son, and Holy Spirit could see that. To anyone else standing around looking on, the only thing that would appear to have been finished 
was Jesus himself. How then can we begin to understand this? How can we begin to understand this great cry as a cry not of defeat, not of a whimpering excuse, but as a proclamation of victory, as an affirmation of success in accomplishing all that he had been sent into the world to do? Several sayings of Jesus before the cross help us understand this next to the last word he speaks from the cross. So let's review some of these things, some of these sayings, which will reveal the world and life view of Jesus. What was his world view? What was this life view of this one who came to seek and to save? Why was Jesus here? What was his purpose in coming to earth? A brief summary and a beautiful one of all that can be found in the, his own statement in John chapter 6, where he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. So the entire meaning of his earthly life is wrapped up in these words. His purpose was to do the will of God his Father, rather than to do his own will. And what a wonderful thing it would be if it could be said of us that this was our purpose as well. That this was the overarching goal of our lives. Not to do our wills, but rather to do the will of God our Father. But you may be wondering, what's so wonderful about that? What's so wonderful about giving up your own will to do the will of somebody else? Well, it's not just somebody else. This is the will of God. His ways are perfect. God's ways are best. Uh, he has complete knowledge. He has full wisdom. Uh, his understanding no one can fathom. Besides this, he's the loving father who knows how to give good gifts to his children. It's not that he seeks to deprive us of anything, but rather to lead us into the very best that could be expected for us. It's the will of the one who is named faithful and true. That is his name. That is his record. That is his fulfillment of his goodness and his purpose to bless his people. What would be wrong with giving up one's will to this one who whose desire is that none should perish, but that all should be called to repentance. This one who has given his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What would be wrong with submitting to the will of someone like that? To exchange our wills, so corrupted, so faulty, so self-serving, so mean, misguided, downright wicked. What would be wrong for giving up these wills to accept, rather, His perfect will, to do His will? Don't you understand, friends, this is the thing which will give our lives ultimate significance? Don't you understand, this is the thing which will give your life its ultimate meaning, and which will give your life its ultimate joy and satisfaction? To do His will rather than your own. But we get it all wrong. We have our own ideas about how it should go. But when men try to substitute their wills for the will of God, they're trying to invent some kind of happiness for themselves that lies outside of God, that lies apart from God. That's what people are trying to do when they assert their own wills, to create, to invent, to, to conjure up some happiness that lies outside of God's perfect plan for them. C.S. Lewis observed in Mere Christianity, out of that hopeless attempt to create happiness for themselves outside of God's will, out of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we can call human history, money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery, the long terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which would make him happy. And so Lewis concludes, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. So when we assert our wills over God's, what are we doing? We're simply, tragically depriving ourselves 
of the happiness, joy, satisfaction, peace, fulfillment, well-being that we could have otherwise. Depriving ourselves of the only true happiness and blessedness that we could ever know. And yet we stubbornly, with a stiff neck, insist on doing it our way rather than his, to our great and eternal loss. If Jesus had lived to satisfy himself, he would not have endured very much of all that he endured in the time between his conception and his death. In fact, he never would have left his father's side. Most certainly, he wouldn't have lived an entirely different life from the one that we have read about in the Gospels. And he never would have been able to say of himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. During the short time he lived, Jesus had every opportunity to become the most powerful, the most popular man in Israel's long history. You know the setting upon his arrival. Everyone was looking for a Messiah. And as he began to exercise his public ministry, he very quickly became all the rage. The common people were hugely impressed that Jesus was not cowed by the corrupt religious establishment. He stood up against them, and the common man under that oppression loved that. And besides this, they saw his miraculous powers. They saw the miracles, the feeding of the thousands, the raising of the dead. He was doubtless the greatest prophet that they had ever known in their nation's history. We can just say it this way, Jesus had it made. The table was set. All that he really needed to do was to go to the pinnacle of the temple, as the devil suggested that he do, and cast himself down to perform this miraculous, uh, spectacular feat before the folks who were looking on there in the packed city, there for the Passover feast. And if he did that, even these reluctant, cynical, unbelieving rulers would not be able to deny his claim to be the Son of God, to be truly the Messiah, the Savior, the King of Israel. It's all it would have taken. One problem. One problem, though. He had not come down from heaven to do his will, but to do the will of him who sent him, the Father who had sent him. And it was the Father's will that he become the sacrificial Lamb of God, the one who would take away all the sins of the world, the sins of all of those who had been given to him by the Father. It was the Father's will that he would become the good shepherd who in the ultimate expression of love would lay down his life for his sheep. Remember Jesus' words uh, during Passion Week? Many of his words from that week would support this concept that I've been suggesting to you that Jesus by his death had accomplished the will of God, but we need mention only two here to highlight them to prove the point. The words that Jesus spoke at the beginning of the Passover observation, the Passover meal, there with his disciples in the upper room, and also the words of his high priestly prayer. The words from the Passover meal there in the upper room we read in John 13. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus knew, it says. Jesus knew. The point is made twice. The path from the Last Supper to the cross and to these almost final words of Jesus was a path that walked intentionally. He walked with his eyes wide open. He knew the outcome. He knew the conclusion of the story. He knew what was going to happen. He had set out on this mission to save his sheep, and he knew that that salvation would include his death on the cross. And so his death is now at hand. He is able to say, it is finished. I have done what the Father sent me to do. The good shepherd has now, here, laid down his life for his sheep. And then from John 17, A few of the words of Jesus' majestic high priestly prayer, further proof added to our understanding that when he said it is finished, he was affirming success in his mission. Speaking to the Father, Jesus said, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. These words spoken just before he went to the cross 
were spoken in anticipation of that victory. And now from the cross, he affirms that victory. He confirms the completion of the task, proclaiming it is finished. And that being so, we hear his seventh and last word from the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And as Luke notes, Jesus did not say this in a whimper. He did not whisper this. He said this in a loud voice. And so we begin to understand something of the power of these words. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus did not lose control there at the very end of his life and die at the hands of sinful men. Instead, he took control, maintained control, even of his own life, even of his own death. He gave himself up to the Father fully for the beloved sheep of the fold, among whom, friends, you and I are included, if you've trusted him as your Savior. Was he giving his life for you when he died on the cross? You can know that he was if you've received that gift and the eternal life which comes in it by faith in him. All of the gospel accounts of Jesus' death made it very clear that this was a sacrificial act, this act of accepting the cup he spoke of, the cup of wrath the Father had assigned to him, Jesus dismissing his spirit into the Father's care. What happened there? His body truly died This was a human body capable of death. But his eternal spirit, when the body died, the spirit ascended into the care of God the Father. It went straight to heaven. Truly, I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus was there in his spirit. It was to be kept there by the Father until that third day. When the body was made alive, and the spirit and the body were reunited in this new constitution, this new form, this transformed body that we're told we will duplicate. Our bodies will resemble when we too are raised from the dead and re, um, re, re, uh, reinvested, re, reinvested with, our, with our eternal spirits. This thrills our souls. How often I've stood at the graveside committing people's bodies to the ground with the great privilege of being able to remind them of the benefits that believers receive from Christ at death. And what does the catechism say? What benefits do believers in Christ receive at death? The souls of believers are at their deaths made perfect in holiness, and do immediately pass into glory. And their bodies, being still united with Christ, do rest in their graves until the resurrection. And then this committing of the spirit and following the reunification of the spirit and the body will will, will, will mimic, will pattern after what has happened as Jesus died and then was raised again. Jesus the good shepherd says he knows his sheep. Jesus the good shepherd says, I'll show you how good a shepherd I am. I will lay down my life for my sheep. I will give my sheep eternal life. And so it's not just that our sins were taken away in his death on the cross, but it's also that in his resurrection, we were given eternal life. We we're put in possession of that life which can never be taken away. And those of us who are older, who are moving on toward uh, the end of the line here on earth, so to speak, counting the end of our days, uh, trickling down now, September song. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> it's a long, long time from May to December, but the days grow short when you reach September. Uh, Those of us living in the September, November era of our life can find comfort in knowing that by God's grace, in the name of our Savior, we also can say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. For us, it's a matter of accepting 
God's good timing for our departure. But for Jesus, it was by his own timing. It was by his own will, in perfect agreement with the Father's will and appointment, that he was able to say these words. And so there's only one way fully to grasp the full final explanation of what Jesus meant when he said these words. It is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And we see this completely revealed in Revelation 21, where we read of the end of all things. And we see into heaven itself, where in the center there's a great white throne. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Our Lord knew that upon his enthronement as king of the kings and lord of the lords over this new heaven, this new earth, he would have completed the master plan for salvation that was determined in the covenant of redemption before there was anything made. The covenant into which the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, entered, agreeing to do each of them all that was necessary to redeem the creation they were about to make, which they knew even then would fall, would fall terribly, would fall beyond all remedy, except for one remedy, that the Father would send the Son who would live for us and who would die for us, and that in God's time, the benefits of the cross, of the life and the death of Jesus, might be applied by the Holy Spirit for the salvation of sinners, and beyond this, for the restoration of all things. Jesus has said, it is finished. All is accomplished. The assignment is fulfilled. Jesus has said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And we hear in this his unlimited surrender to God. We hear in this the echoes of his complete confidence in God. From his side, it is finished. From his side, that commitment is complete final, ultimate. But for us, friends, the question might remain open. There might be some question for us, because for every person at some point in his life, in her life, there's a step, a crucial step that must be taken, an act of faith, an act of surrender. The surrender of your will to the will of the same Father to whom Jesus surrendered himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. The same Father to whom he committed his life for eternity uh, on the cross. So we think of it in two spheres, in two realms, in two senses. In one sense, the work of Jesus was completed back there at Calvary. It was finished, just as he declared. But in another sense, this work of Jesus on your behalf is completed only when, by faith, at the prompting of his Holy Spirit, you claim the gift. You receive the blessing. You say, yes, this is what I need. This is what I want. Lord Jesus, come and be my Savior and be my Lord. If you're able to save sinners, then I'm one and I need you to save me. This finished work of Christ must be applied to you, to me, to all persons in time and in space. The work is finished, but in a sense it's not finished until you commit your life to him. And that act of faith, this expression of commitment sets in motion this irreversible, unchangeable, unbreakable, immutable process by which his work will ultimately be finished in you when you are at last fully completely finally made perfect in holiness and conformed to his glorious image in heaven which is where you can say will say I'm home I'm home 
at last. And in that time, in that place, in the fullest sense, for you, it will be finished. And your commitment to him will be eternal. Let's pray and thank him for it. Lord God, thank you for the sufficiency of Christ's life to secure heaven for us by living fully obedient before the law. Thank you for his sacrificial death by which he, the sinless one, bore the sins of many. Our iniquities were laid upon him and he satisfied for them all. Now, we ask the gift of faith that we might comprehend these things to the point that our souls are made safe with Jesus and then cause to arise in us great measures of fullness and abundance of joy and gratitude, thanksgiving and heartfelt praise, knowing it's finished for us and the commitment has been made. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary. I said.
Now, people of God, receive the blessings of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.